Both candidates in Congressional District 2 are acknowledging a major upset. According to unofficial voting data from the Secretary of State's office, Democrat Gabe Vasquez has an advantage of just over 1,000 votes, as you've probably heard, over Republican incumbent Yvette Harrell. Now, that pushed him to declare victory Wednesday, and Ms. Harrell has conceded her seat. And Dan, let me start with you. Are you, are you surprised Ms. Harrell isn't pushing for a recount, even given her denial of the 2020 elections? Got to throw that in there. But, you know, 1,000 plus votes is not a whole lot. Are you surprised? I was a little surprised that, that she conceded quickly. Um, her, her history in um, 2018, I, 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 I don't recall her um, conceding very quickly at all. And there was some talk, there was some right. talk of litigation and things right. like that. And this was just a razor thin margin. Um, but uh, apparently she took a, th a look at the numbers and decided it, it just wasn't worth it. I, th I think a candidate has to pay if, um, yes. for a recount if it's not within the, uh, the automatic margin. So that That's may right. have been a factor as well. That's right. And they pay for everything if it turns out they don't flip the script, so to speak. Yeah. Senator, um, a pending lawsuit over, uh, from the Republican Party over, over redistricting, particularly CD2. I'm curious your thoughts on that. I, I want to talk about redistricting kind of in whole in a little bit. But uh, in this specific case, do you think the party will try to make a, a fuss over this a little bit more? Yes, uh, yeah. definitely. Redistricting was the major factor in this uh, congressional election. Right. Uh, each of the districts was made uh, more competitive between Republicans and Democrats, right. uh, but none more so than uh, down south where right. um, some of those heavily Republican districts <coughs> were um, put into uh, CD1 and CD3. Right. Um, and so, yes, um, the Republicans will be a day late and a dollar short mm -hmm. there with their lawsuit because it won't affect the outcome here. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it might add grist for the mill to the idea that we really need a truly independent redistricting uh, commission mm -hmm. uh, rather uh, rather than one where the legislature still has the final say. Mm -hmm. Although I do think that the redistricting process was much better sure. this year. Yeah. And um, they did adopt many of the ideas of that uh, commission. Mm -hmm. Interesting points there. You know, guys, when I look at the results coming in, of course, for CD2, uh, Mr. Vasquez, he cleaned up in a lot of areas close to the metro, meaning up here, Bernalillo County, he was plus 18. Uh, lots of, you know, he was plus, plus, plus in huge counties, Rebecca. And Ms. Harrell, of course, cleaned up in her home area. And I, I gotta wonder, is, are we now a CD2 world where you gotta lean into the Albuquerque metro part of it a whole lot more than your natural rural part of your state? And who does that benefit over the long run? You see what I'm trying to drive at here? I think, it, Interesting. I think for now, as long as the districts stay within the boundaries that they are set right now, then yes, you, you can't, the numbers just don't make sense for you to only focus on rural New Mexico for, for, that, for that district. Mm -hmm. I participated in the redistricting process for the city of Albuquerque mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. And so I sat through the same Brian Sanderoff uh, presentations, uh, learned m so much about the principles of redistricting and what you're really trying to do is keep districts the most intact. You're, you're, you're trying to have the, the least amount of change on voters wherever they are. And, and so ultimately the Albuquerque City Council ended up adopting the recommendation that really had the least amount of change. Not so for the state of New Mexico and for those congressional districts. So with that shift, you know, you, you, just going by the numbers, there really should have been a lot more energy spent in Bernalillo County. Right. Did Ms. Harrell spend a lot of, enough time up here? I don't recall her really stumping that hard in this new part of her district. You know, I, I, I don't know. I'm yeah. not a constituent of hers, yeah. and so I didn't see her much up here. I know that it was, it, it took me a little while to figure out why we had ads for uh, that race running in the Albuquerque metro area. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so I didn't, I, yeah, a lot of ads. I didn't, yeah. I didn't see her here. Um, and mm -hmm. I know that there's a lot to be said for the southern part of Bernalillo County and rural and agriculture and, and how it can relate to the southern part of the state. But um, uh, whatever it was, it clearly didn't work. Right. 
Interesting, when I look at these numbers here, again, Mr. Vasquez was plus 18 in Bernalillo County. He was plus 13 in Doña Ana County, his home county. I mean, he really did well up here. I, I, I got to wonder why that is. But Dan, another interesting thing that happened during uh, the last part of the campaign was Mr. Vasquez not joining Mr. Biden on his visit here. We mused about that a little bit on Tuesday night about why that might have been. Any intel on, on f or even your own thoughts about why he passed up? A sitting president visit in his own party? Uh, well, uh, Biden is, you know, his pop, his popularity is not high. That's right. why, um, you know, the underlying fundamentals really kind of favored Republicans. Um, a lot of people thought heading into this election because mm -hmm. we, you know, we're at the midterm of a of an unpopular president. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, it could be just that we've entered an area where all our presidents are going to be unpopular. You know, it's hard, it's hard to know. People are so polarized right. and angry. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that I, that I assume was a deliberate choice not to join Biden on the campaign trail. All, all, almost all the other Democrats were there. Um, but, uh, you know, he, he made that choice and I mean, he, he won the election. So I'm, I'm guessing right. he's not second guessing himself. That's, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, you know, it was easy to put that in a weird box at the time, but now looking back, it's always like, hmm, pretty smart there. Uh, Senator CD1, um, obviously Melanie Stansbury held uh, 12 percentage points. Is the district more competitive being redrawn here? Speaking about redrawing, I mean, we have a Republican who was their second time in as a, as a challenger here, but not much better. What, what do you think about CD1's redrawn? I think, well, CD1 has a few more rural areas right. than it did before. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Melanie campaigned in those areas in Torrance County, uh, mm -hmm. part, a little bit of Santa Fe County. Um, and I think she, she has a very good reputation. Um, she, um, she's carved out a spot for herself mm -hmm. in terms of uh, being a water expert yes. and also um, you know, all of the Democratic, uh, uh, the two Democratic women incumbents were very good at using the fact that they had about infrastructure. Right. Biden's infrastructure bill really benefited New Mexico, uh -huh. and he benefited, and it benefited those rural areas. You could see it up north with the response to the fire as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Melanie was uh, played on that very well. Um, she also. Uh, has a way of supporting and joining hands with local Democratic candidates, mm -hmm. uh, which I think really uh, served her very well mm -hmm. in some of those uh, some of those areas. Some of those candidates didn't win, uh, but she tried to help them, and I think in turn that helped her. Interesting point there because I'm recalling in, in her candidate conversation with our own Gwyneth Dolan, she embraced the new parts of the district. She felt like yeah. I'm ready for Roswell. this. Let's just go. She said, oh, my yeah. grandmother lived in Roswell. That's right. I really, you know, I really am so happy to to, to have that. Mm -hmm. If I can jump Please. in right there. Please, absolutely. Yeah. You know, immediately after redistricting, after the legislature redistricted, mm -hmm. Stansbury was like the first person who came out and was like, I'm excited to reach out to Torrance County and these rural areas and you know, I'm going to try and serve all these new constituents. And she she was probably the most vocal among all the mm -hmm. uh, sitting Congress people about, you know, OK, I'm going to embrace this new area I have. That's right. Good point. I'm glad you brought that up because mm -hmm. she really was out front on that. Rebecca, interesting. Michelle Garcia Holmes, I mentioned that was her second try at this. Didn't quite work. What didn't click there? Was it a PR problem, a issues problem? What happened? I, I think it was likely, I suspect it was an issues problem going mm -hmm. back to the campaign against her that used her words. And I guess, I mean, they are her words mm -hmm. uh, about abortion. Mm -hmm. And especially in this district, yes. you know, we are incredibly passionate about uh, women's rights, women's health rights. Uh, you know, like, and I think it's so easy to throw around abortion, abortion, abortion. This is not about abortion. This is about a woman's right to make decisions for her own health. And so that just doesn't get enough traction here in the, in the metro area. And, um, and then the numbers where it does get traction are not enough to, to come back from that. Yeah, good point there. Let's go to CD3 real quick. Um, Senator incumbent, of course, Teresa Leger Fernandez. Not a bad, you know, 37,000 votes more than her opponent and that added up to six points. She, again, the same question about redistricting. Let's go there first. Did that, she seemed to be embracing of the new district no, as well. No, 
Initially, yeah. she was very uh, dubious. She thought her her chances would, were diminished by the new ah. by the new district, and then she warmed up to it. Gotcha. Uh, and and did very well. I think she ran a terrific campaign. Her mm -hmm. commercials were among the best yeah. uh, that I've seen this cycle. Yeah. Um, she just she sort of based her campaign on love, mm. <laughs> which is you know a rather uh, a unique thing. I saw a picture of her. And, and a su couple of her supporters mm -hmm. uh, out at the polling place on election day, I think it was at the Santa Fe Fairgrounds. And uh, uh. There, there was music, there were handmade signs, yeah. there were people that were enthused and of course thankful to her for their, their help after the fire. She, was, she really pitched herself as a daughter of Northern right. New Mexico, Daughter didn't she? Mexico. Quite effectively. Yeah. I have to agree, mm -hmm. those TV ads were, were really well. Rebecca, I'm, 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 I'm curious to hear your thoughts on CD3 as well. Again, in the Challenger, second time around, I misspoke, it, wasn't, it was more than six points she won by, by the way. Sorry about that. Um, what did not work for the Challenger up there this time? I just, um, I, and again, it's not, I, I don't have as much insight there. Right. Um, it's just my own personal opinion that she just was not able to um, t to rally enough. I mean, you have to, I, I think if, if you either have to be like really, really for something or really, really against something in that situation and whatever she was really, really against, right. uh, Teresa Ledra Fernandez was more for things. So I, don't, I just don't think that Alexis Martinez Johnson had enough uh, for people to rally around. I gotta, she's an oil and gas person for sure, uh, steadfast, but climate change is a big issue here. I gotta wonder in the broadest sense, do Republicans perhaps need to change their tone and tenor on climate change in New Mexico uh, to, get, to get votes, frankly? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I, I mean, know. because I, I'm, you know, that's one of the reasons that that I am so um, that I am so connected to th being an independent voter, mm -hmm. because um, I, I feel like I don't the, re the the message of, yes, oil and gas, so important to New Mexico. It pays for our schools. It mm -hmm. pays for our roads. It pays for public safety. It's everything. But we're also going to try and get rid of it. Uh, but then it's very confusing. And I don't like the tone deaf. Uh, approach that the Republican Party has taken to um, uh, to climate change sure. and uh, and how it's going to impact New Mexico's future. Especially when you have the other side pounding that issue, you can't just like not touch it. Right. And at some levels, it's interesting. I'm interested in your thoughts on that as well, Senator. Yeah, but don't think that the oil and gas interests don't also court the Democrats right. and pour lots of money into Democratic campaigns, including the uh, Michelle Lujan Grisham, right. including the. Um, the head of the Appropriations Committee in the House, mm -hmm. uh, they, are, uh, they are big donors there because mm -hmm. they know that their fate lies in the hands of the governor and the, and the legislature. Right. Dan, your thought on that as well, the idea that the oil and gas industry still has a big say here, so to speak, financially and otherwise, and not just in their home area, you know, Hobbs, et cetera, but all over the state. Is there, are, are there fingerprints here from, the, from that oil and gas industry? We should pay attention yeah, to. I, th I think that, um, you know, both parties are cognizant, whether they want to say it out loud or not, that oil and gas is a, just a huge, uh, provides an enormous amount of revenue for the state government, mm -hmm. and it also injects a ton of money into campaigns. And I think that mm -hmm. uh, that certainly gives you a seat at the table, you know, whether you're talking to a powerful Democrat or right. a powerful Republican, um, you know, and to, to kind of build on Rebecca's point, um, you know, for some of these Republican candidates, you know, they're in a blue state and they they do need to, um, to in order to win, they have to pick up Democratic votes, you know. So, um, you know, being attuned to climate change or some of these other issues that they feel like might cross over, um, right. you know, to, to win, these candidates are going to have to get some re Democrats to vote for Republicans. It's awfully tough coming out of a brutal primary season where you got to really throw red meat out there and then suddenly make a big switch in the general. That's awfully tough, Rebecca, isn't it? It's yeah, a difficulty. I, 
it's so awful that um, that frankly you have to be extreme to win a primary, right. and then you have to be more moderate to win a general, and mm -hmm. it and then it comes out as well flip flop, flip flop, flip flop, and then mm -hmm. and then again that's where we end up with um, with uh, disengaged voters because mm -hmm. you're really for someone, and then and then they're not for that anymore, and then you're left saying, well, then I just don't want to go to the, the the polls. I really feel like the statewide elections had a huge impact too on the on the congressional elections because low we're so local, right? Yes. New Mexicans yes. were so local. And so yeah. if you don't have enough people who are really passionate about who they're going to vote for, for for governor, that will impact the races for Congress. Good points there. Thank you to our panelists once again. We'll be back at this table for a final discussion on some of the other statewide and legislative races. Very interesting.